So, um, Cloud PBX with PSTN Calling Services is, some, is what we're going to talk about today. It's a relatively new offering, um, which has become part of the Office 365 uh, suite or set of services that are available through uh, subscription-based uh, application, if you like. So, anyone who doesn't already have a 365 subscription, um, they are uh, services such as messaging, uh, email, uh, SharePoint, like for business, which was formerly known as Link, those types of Microsoft services that are available as cloud services through Office 365. So there's there's not a requirement to have any on-premises equipment. Um, and in in much the same way that many people are moving their mail to 365 now uh, and and doing away with on-premises Exchange servers, um, that's kind of a good analogy to look at Cloud PBX uh, with. It's very similar at the moment. You you have a an on-premises phone system or private branch exchange, PBX, for, for jargon busting exercise. Um, and by removing that from on-premises and taking out a Cloud PBX subscription, you're essentially moving the functionality and services that that appliance offers up to the cloud and doing away with the overhead costs and on-premises hardware, if you like. And so that's what Microsoft have come to the table with. Um, but it doesn't work on its own. It needs a, a way to connect it to the the public switch telephone network, and that's where our calling services come in. So as I just alluded to there, the cloud PBX aspect is Microsoft's intention to replace your existing PBX with similar features to what you currently have on your phone system, but from 365. And in conjunction with a calling plan service, they also have the ability to connect you to the public switch telephone network, thereby giving your users the ability to make and receive uh, calls to landlines and mobile phones. And together, you can't have one without the other. Uh, those two components together is what will replace your, your on-premises PBX, OK? When you go away and read about Cloud PBX, um, if it's something that you'd like to know more about, the chances are you'll read about it in one of two iterations. What we're going to talk about today is the, the diagram on the left, Cloud PBX with PSTN calling services, those calling services provided by Microsoft. Microsoft are connecting you to the public switch telephone network. Um, but for people that are perhaps invested in Skype for Business hardware already on their premises or in their offices, or perhaps they're tied in by existing contracts with telephone providers for three to five years, for example, um, then there is a way you can use Cloud PBX and leverage that on-premises PSTN connectivity. So there's two SKUs, if you like. Uh, the option on the left, which we're going to talk about, and the option on the right uh, for people that, that don't want to use Microsoft to connect to the public telephone network. They're happy using their own local connectivity that they, they perhaps have already got, be it a SIP trunk uh, or an ISDN connection. And naturally, uh, the one on the right requires on-premises hardware, either through an existing Microsoft Link or Skype for Business deployment or something called a Cloud Connect Edition, which is a bunch of virtual machines which will sit on hardware on your premises. Uh, but the important thing to note is that there is additional resources required, uh, resources that then need ongoing management and perhaps additional costs involved, etc. in terms of maintenance. So the one we're going to look at today on the left, the Cloud PBX with PSTN calling services, um, is a what they refer to as a completely in the cloud solution. We don't need anything on premises at all. Um, the only thing that will be there is the desk phone that the user is going to pick up to make the call in the first instance. And the, the arrows on the two diagrams there are just kind of designed to show you the call flow that's involved if a user is to make a call in any one of those scenarios. And you can see in the completely in the cloud solution, the dotted line represents the, the call setup, if you like, how the call is originally set up. And then the solid line is the voice, the actual media flow. And on the left, you can see that in both instances, the call setup and the media flow, uh, when the user picks up the handset and makes a call, it goes to 365 and then breaks out onto the PSTN. Uh, in contrast, if you've got local breakout with Cloud PBX, uh, then the signaling goes up and down through 365, but the actual media flow will break out directly from your offices to your existing uh, through your existing telephone connection. I feel those two diagrams are perhaps the best way to explain the difference there. But if you just remember, completely in the cloud solution on the left, and a kind of hybrid solution uh, on the right. And we're focusing on the one on the left today. I just wanted everyone to be aware of, of the other option, which you will most definitely come across if, if you go away and, and read about something. 
So the Cloud PBX feature set itself, and remember this is um, this is the telephone system itself, so this is the equivalent of what you have in your offices at the moment, but in the cloud now. The feature set is very similar to what you might find on your current telephone system. So you've got the uh, de facto industry standards there, the ability to answer a call, transfer a call, put people on hold, those types of things. All the core basic functionality of a telephone system exists within Cloud PBX at the moment. Um, because it's a Microsoft product, they have the um, fortunate circumstance of being able to integrate a lot more heavily into other Microsoft products such as Exchange and Outlook, for example. So you can um, do call forwarding and call routing based on calendar entries that you have in your Outlook calendar. So if you're on a meeting at a particular time in the day, then um, Cloud PBX will know that you shouldn't accept calls at that time and it will forward them to whatever you have configured as a call forwarding option. Uh, things like camping and tagging there, top of the middle column. If someone's not available, you can uh, tag them uh, so that they you get an alert when they become available. Those types of things, perhaps not so um, common on traditional PBX and more unique to, to Cloud PBX and Skype for Business. Um, Something that is worth mentioning is uh, the biggest roadblock at the moment with Cloud PBX and why it hasn't been adopted instantly off the bat by a large amount of organizations is the auto attendant and automatic call distribution limitation that currently exists. You won't see anything on there about the ability to have an auto attendant or IVR. And what I mean by that is when you call into an organization, if that organization's main number is picked up straight away by a receptionist, then that's fine. Cloud PBX probably already has the features that you require uh, to replace your phone system with. Uh, that's quite a broad statement, but you'll, you'll see where I'm going with this. Um, but if your um, if your main number hits some kind of interactive uh, automatic call distribution service where you're offered to press one for sales, two for technical department, three for another department, so on and so forth, that option doesn't yet exist um, in Cloud PBX. Now, the roadmap, unfortunately, I'm not privy to, but it was announced earlier this year that they are developing something referred to as an organizational auto attendant. And that will start to make inroads into that type of functionality. And the beauty of being a subscription service means that you have the benefit of always running the latest product. So it's, it's not like on-premises software where you buy a 2013 version and then 2015 comes out you have to manually go through the upgrade process. One of the benefits of any Office 365 subscription service is you're always running the latest technology um, under a predictable cost model because it's a sub subscription service. Okay. So as well as um, listing out all the many uh, pieces uh, or the great feature set that, that Skype for Business with Cloud PBX does have, um, be very aware of the IVR and auto attendant limitation at the moment. Okay. Okay, the licensing requirements for Cloud PBX then. I mentioned before that the Cloud PBX solution is delivered through Office 365. And depending on what functionality you require, there are various licenses that unlock certain pieces of functionality. And I've kind of put them into mandatory, typical, and situational, although that might not, you might consider them to be one or the other based on your own circumstances. Um, but to enable Skype for Business to be a Cloud PBX solution, it, you you need to give each user a Cloud PBX license. That unlocks the features that we looked at on the previous slide there, the ability calls, etc., hold calls, transfer, etc. If you then want to connect uh, your Cloud PBX users to the public switch telephone network, we already said that it's a two-part two model. You need the Cloud PBX and the PSTN calling plan. So you need a PSTN calling plan uh, subscribed to as well and also given to that same user. So that's us with our Cloud PBX and our PSTN calling plan, and that's that's unlocked us and given us our full PBX solution. Exchange Online Plan 2 is listed there because, as it says, that's what gives you your voicemail services. When someone leaves you a voicemail in Cloud PBX, it's handled by Exchange uh, Unified Messaging on the back end. Uh, that unified messaging is part of Exchange Online Plan 2. So as such, the user needs to be enabled for Exchange Online Plan 2. And already you can see we're looking at uh, uh, more than just a couple of licenses to have someone fully up and running for Cloud PBX. But it's important to remember, and this will be clear later on when I look at the uh, do some cost examples with you, 
if you're already a 365 user and you already subscribe to an enterprise plan, for example, let's just say E3, then some of these licenses will, will already be included in that plan. So this is I'm just listing out here all the licenses that are involved. It's not to say that you might not already have some of these, and that will become apparent later on. Um, end of the typical box there, I've got Skype for Business client license uh, required for the use of the desktop client. Um, Cloud PBX extends the Skype for Business desktop software to be a phone system. If you don't already have Office, uh, Office Pro Plus that includes a Skype for Business client license, then you'd need to purchase one of those. Um, it may be that when you deploy Cloud PBX, you're not going to use the uh, soft client. You might decide that everyone's going to just have a physical desk phone. If that's the case, um, then you won't require a Skype for Business desktop client license. But I've listed it under typical there because really to take advantage of Skype for Business and the instant messaging um, and the presence information and uh, conferencing, video conferencing, everything that comes with the Skype for Business uh, feature set, you kind of do need um, the, de the desktop client it would be um, a backward step to subscribe to all these um, licenses and then only have a desktop phone. You'd be limiting your users in the functionality that they do, would have available to them if they had the soft client. So that's why that's listed under typical. And then at the bottom there, under situational PSTN conferencing and consumption billing um, are licenses that not every user will require. Um, but may be, may be required for particular users based on how they use the system. For example, PSTN conferencing, as it states there, required for users to schedule conferences with PSTN dial-in access. When you send out a meeting invite, like this one that you may well have received for this webinar, on that meeting invite will be a DDI telephone number that you could have dialed to come into this conference and listen to me um, talking. You could have dialed that from a landline or a mobile number. Um, if a user isn't assigned a PSTN conferencing license, when they send out their meeting invites, they wouldn't have that number on the bottom. So the reason why this isn't required for everyone is because it may well be in an organization of 20 users, it's always going to be perhaps, I don't know, the, a receptionist that organizes the meetings. And if that's the case, then she's the only one that needs the PSTN conferencing license assigned to her. Um, so that's why that's under situational. And the PSTN consumption billing isn't actually a license you pay for, it's just something you assign, and we'll talk about that um, in a later slide. But those, those licenses are pretty much everything that can be involved um, when you're considering how people are going to use Cloud PBX. Um, whether some of those are already in place through existing Office 365 subscriptions, that's the kind of um, license analysis that you need to go through when you're considering uh, Cloud PBX. Okay, PSTN calling plans. So on the previous slide, the first two licenses were the Cloud PBX license itself, which we said every user must have if they're going to use um, Cloud PBX. And then we said the second one they needed was a PSTN calling plan license. But there are two SKUs of PSTN calling plan license. As you can see there, we have a domestic calling plan and a domestic and international calling plan. They're quite self-explanatory in as much as if a user has a domestic calling plan, um, then they can only make calls to domestic numbers, national uh, and local numbers. Uh, in contrast, if they've got the, the latter option there, then they can also make calls to um, international numbers as well. Uh, in 196 countries, it states there. Uh, we'll talk about it in consumption billing, but if you're planning on making a call to a country that's outside those 196 countries, then you would need consumption billing, and I'll, I'll talk about that, like I said, in a, in a later slide. It mentions the amount of minutes you get there. The UK has been hard done by in contrast to the States for some reason. Um, perhaps we get our point across a lot quicker. Uh, but you get 1,200 minutes uh, domestic, and if you've got an international plan, then you get 600 as well. Uh, at the top there, it says PSTN calling plan minutes are pooled at the tenant level to create a total amount of organizational minutes. Calling plan minutes do not carry over to the next month, regardless of uh, usage. So by pooling minutes, what we mean is if your organization had 10 users and you subscribed to Cloud PBX and each of those users had the domestic calling plan, that would give you 12,000 minutes, because 1,200 times 10, that would give you 12,000 minutes across your organization at the tenant level 
to use as you saw fit. And the same is true for the domestic and international calling plan as well. Uh, they get pooled at the tenant level. The reason why it says or uh, in those statements at the bottom, the last two bullet points, uh, United Kingdom 1,200 minute, uh, domestic minutes or 600 international minutes, is because your monthly allowance is based on whichever of those thresholds you hit first at the pool level. So if you reach your international uh, dialing threshold first, then that, that's, that's you hit your limits um, for, your, for your monthly calling allowance, if you like. Once again, consumption billing can give you a bit of a safety net, and I'll allude to that shortly. Um, but really, the only takeaways from uh, the PSTN calling plan itself are just know that minutes don't carry over, so you can't save them up. And then, perhaps more importantly, everything is pooled at the tenant level, um, which may or may not work to your benefit, depending on how busy particular areas of your business are. But you'll quite often find that it is particular business sectors that make, um, or within the organization, that make more calls than other people. And perhaps an individual is making 2,500, 3,000 minutes worth of calls each month. Well, that's OK, because in other areas of your business, they're getting nowhere near their 1,200 allowance. So it peters it out. So it, it is good, although it's on a per user basis, it's kind of addressing the requirement at an organizational level. So that, that's, that's extremely useful. Um, I don't think there's anything else really of note to, to mention about PSTN uh, calling plans at the moment. Consumption billing, I mentioned at the beginning on the initial slide, it, it's, it's not a license that's applied to a user per se with a cost. But each user can be enabled on a per user basis for consumption billing. Um, so consider the scenario, and it alludes to it in the first line there. If you don't set up PSTN consumption billing uh, and enable users for it, and you run out of minutes in your organization, then you won't be able to make um, outbound uh, calls from your organization. So think of consumption billing as a bit of a safety net that makes sure that your business doesn't come to a grinding halt just because. Um, you've got some maths wrong, or you've had an extremely busy period on the phones during a particular bill, uh, billing month. Uh, this is your safety net that will allow you to continue to make telephone calls um, funded through a different manner. You can do it in one of two manners, uh, one-time funding or an auto recharge. The one-time funding allows you to deposit a certain amount into your tenancy which will then sit there, say for example, you put £100 of credit in as your consumption billing amount, that £100 sit there. If on any given month, every, uh, as an organization, you're within your pooled calling limits, that £100 will just continue to sit there in the next billing month. That's your safety net. If, for example, um, you get to the 29th of that month and you've exceeded your pool uh, dialing allowance, you can continue to make outbound calls and instead of, um, well, you can continue to make outbound calls, and the consumption billing amount that you've put into your pot will start to be reduced. It's reduced as per the rate card that Microsoft published publicly for dialing national and international numbers. So you can see, uh, it is predictive, you can, you can see what the costings would be prior to, to topping up your, your consumption pot, if you like. The downside to a one-time funding is, um, once you've... Uh, exhausted that funding that you put into that pot, then the same scenario would ring true. You would come to a grinding halt in terms of outbound calls. So you kind of need to have a, an idea and an indication of what your predicted calling minutes, etc., might be. So perhaps more favorable is the second of the two methods, the auto recharge method, where you set two values. The first value you set is the amount of money you want to deposit into your consumption billing pot. Uh, for example, £100 again. And then you can create a second value, a threshold value, which is a lower value, which when reached will refresh with the aforementioned recharge value, which might be £20. So you deposit £100. For some reason, you start eating into consumption uh, billing pot. That pot goes down to £20, and another 100 is automatically uh, added to the consumption pot. That's probably more preferable if after a month, for some reason, you've had to refu uh, refresh your auto recharge consumption billing pot six, seven, eight times, then naturally you would address the, the reasons as to why that's happened um, at the end of that month and perhaps remove particular individual individuals from being able to use consumption billing, etc. 
So with the consumption billing uh, process itself, typically you're not going to enable everyone in your organization for consumption billing. Um, perhaps once again, key areas like uh, contact centers or places that have busy calls and particularly key stakeholders, executives, those types of people you would typically enable for consumption billing so that they don't notice any kind of interruption uh, on the user side and you can pick up the, the bits and pieces at the end of the month and just try to more accurately align your expectations with your costs and how your consumption billing is configured, etc. Okay. Um, I mentioned before that if you dial out on your international dialing plan to a country that's not in those 196 listed countries, uh, then that wouldn't come out of your your PSTN international and domestic calling plan. That too would come out of your, your consumption and billing part. You also have the ability in a conference like we're in now, I could dial somebody um, at home on their landline and say, hey, do you know what? I'm doing a conference. Why don't you just stay here and listen to this conference? Well, that type of call that I make from a conference to someone else, that would also come out of uh, PSTN consumption billing. Okay, so this is your safety net. I think at the beginning we listed under um, this license of the situational, but if, if I'm honest, in hindsight now, that's probably going to go under typical because I can't think of a scenario where you wouldn't want to enable consumption billing for particular users, especially um, just because there's no licensing cost involved and it's a one-time fee that you're going to put in a pot that does roll over to the next month, unlike your, your monthly uh, minute allowance on your PSTN calling plan. Okay. Number of provisioning. Um, so say for example, you're completely sold on Cloud PBX, you're happy with the current feature set, or perhaps in the distant future, the feature set expands and it becomes um, something that you're highly interested in. You're happy with the licensing that's required, you're happy with the PSTN calling plans and the consumption billing. The next option to consider is the number provisioning and how you go about assigning numbers to individuals in your organization. You can have new numbers that are provided by Microsoft when you enable users for Cloud PBX. Uh, or you can take your existing numbers um, that you have on your current phone system that are provided to you by your existing telco, and you can port those numbers to Microsoft. Realistically, the bottom of those two options is going to be the, the option that most organizations will adopt. The main reason being that any organization that's been around for, well, to be honest, even six months would have already published a number of uh, contact numbers in the public domain. Uh, those numbers might be on websites, they might be on printed documentation, they might be on users' mobile phones or other contact lists, for example. So it does make sense um, that you retain your existing numbers if you're a well-established organization. So the process by which you can do that is called a number port and this is the bottom option we're referring to on the diagram here guys uh, it's, it's a number port uh, in America at the moment if you're a US uh, organization then you can take care of your number port request and tracking through the office 365 portal uh, in the UK we're not so fortunate at the moment and your number port request has to be submitted uh, to Microsoft manually through a technical support request and then Microsoft will engage with you regarding the, uh, the number port process itself. You'll need to act as a liaison between Microsoft and your existing provider. Naturally, you need to make the existing provider aware, whether it's uh, BT, Virgin, uh, Gamma, whoever. You need to make them aware that you're undergoing a number port. Those two parties would then agree on a number porting date, um, which typically, as, as alluded to there, 30 days, providing there's no uh, hitches or gotchas from, from either of those providers. Uh, you'd agree on a date on which the number port is going to take place, typically on a weekend or outside business hours. Um, and those numbers would then become available in the 365 Cloud PBX interface for you to assign uh, to users. Um, it mentions you can track the process um, in the Microsoft portal. You, you can do that. That's only Microsoft's um, side of the equation, if you like. Anything, any update you need from your existing provider, whether they're having any problems, etc., you need to naturally liaise with them, uh, like I said, whether it's BT or Virgin, for example. The second bullet point down says that you can only number port from available uh, select carriers within the UK. Uh, the list is quite extensive. Um, there are people on there that I've not even heard of. So 
the, the chances of you being with a carrier that isn't on that list are um, fairly small. The list is publicly available online. Be very aware that if your existing telephone carrier isn't on that list, that's not to say that the um, you can't put your numbers away from them. Many smaller telcos and service providers in the UK uh, are actually just resellers or fronting or, um, for something like a BT circuit and BT are on that list. So if, if you're with, I don't know, telephone one, two, three, um, because they're really cheap and they won't be on that list, don't fret, just find out. Um, find out if they're reselling a BT service or if it's BT back end behind them because in that case you, you can port the numbers away because BT are on that list. Um, although not as popular then, it is possible to provision new numbers within Office 365. Uh, the process is super straightforward and provides, I mentioned their rapid provisioning unlike the 30 day process. When you enable a user for Cloud PBX and you give them PSTN calling plan, uh, you can literally go away and, and start picking your numbers that you want to assign to those users there and then. Um, you select from a drop-down menu uh, the country that you're currently operating in and then the region that you're operating in. And then you can pick a city and that will naturally define the area codes that prefix all the numbers you're offered to choose from. They will offer you blocks of numbers. So it won't just be random numbers picked out of a hat. They will take a giant block and they will present them to you on the screen. And I think off the top of my head, that that's kind of reserved for 10 minutes, um, after which those numbers go back into the pot and you'd have to click request again to get a new bunch of numbers. Uh, be aware, I'm down in Exeter, for example. That's where I work. Uh, I can't select Exeter from that drop-down list and get an 01392 bunch of numbers. Uh, the closest I could pick was Plymouth, which I don't know the area code for, but it's, it's not the same as Exeter. 01752, I've just been advised. Um, so just be aware that if you're taking new numbers, then um, then that, that's also a consideration. When I've set this up on my own tenancy, for example, um, I've, I've pretended to be a lot bigger than I actually am, and I've picked the 020 number from London. Um, perhaps that's beneficial from an organizational perspective. If you're a small startup business and you, you're going with Cloud PBX and you've got like 10 users, um, to have an 020 number fronting your business and your DDIs, that's... You might be in uh, might be in North Wales, but with O2O numbers, you know people think you're a London-based operation. So that's not a bad thing um, when you look at it from that perspective. The amount of numbers that you get if you're not porting your numbers, if you're taking new numbers, um, is 10% plus 10 rule. Uh, what that means is, say your organisation has 10 users, uh, you get 10 you get 10 numbers plus 10%. 10% of 10 is an extra one, so you get 11 numbers. Add 10. 21 numbers. So for an organization of 10 users, you'd be allowed 21 DDIs uh, for free from Microsoft. Why do you need 21 DDIs? Well, each user is going to have their own DDI telephone number. And then with the feature set expansion that we've got on the horizon with the IVR and the auto attendance that we talked about shortly, um, those types of services, they'll need their public numbers as well assigning to them. So they've already catered for that in the number provisioning process. It would be uh, ridiculous to only give you enough numbers for your users and then introduce things like um, IVRs and stuff and automatic call distribution. They need their own numbers as well. So this is what gives you those extra numbers to take care of those features uh, when they're finally released. Um, that's number of provisioning, quite straightforward. Like I said, the most popular option is going to be the, the, the bottom one of the two. It just, it just require a degree of planning when it comes to the number porting date that will uh, that will be put in stone. That will essentially be your go-live date for your Cloud PBX solution. Okay, endpoints, end, end uh, clients, and devices. You can have um, desk phones, or you can have mobile devices, or you can have the soft client with use as a headset. The bullet point or the, the caption at the top of the slide is very very pertinent indeed. Be aware of the hidden cost that comes with any new telephony platform, desk phones. Always be sure to shortlist a headset for users happy to use soft client only. So the desk phone hidden cost, um, I've done a lot of Skype for Business, Link, OCS deployments on premises for organizations ranging from 10 to 2,000 users. If you consider even the organization with 100 users in buying 100 desk phones at 100 pound a pop, 
um, you've, you've instantly got an additional hidden cost of £10,000 there. So it's all very well doing the licensing cost analysis that we'll look at shortly, um, but please don't don't forget you, you need to take into consideration the endpoint device cost as well, particularly if you're using desk phones across the board and you're in a kind of medium-sized organization. The soft client um, is the Skype for Business desktop software that runs on either a Windows uh, or Mac PC. Uh, it is, does require a license. We mentioned it at the beginning. We also mentioned that if you've got Office, 3, uh, Office Pro Plus, then that license will be included. Typically, um, it's going to be used by all users because it, it's that, that application allows for instant messaging, presence, and extends the, the Skype for Business functionality. You can also use the mobile device client, which is available on iPhone or iOS, Android, and Windows phone. It's not available on BlackBerry, uh, which was ceased way back in, in when Skype for Business was called Link 2010. Um, so it does need to be on one of those three major vendors. Um, and if you have mobile users or people that don't use PCs often, then you can forgo their use of the desktop client and perhaps have them just use the, the mobile application on their smartphone. Phone. It's available in all the application stores for, for those vendors. Desk phones. There are an array of desk phones available for Skype for Business if you have it deployed in an on-premises solution. But when you're using Skype for Business with Cloud PBX, um, which we're talking about today, then there are only a short amount of qualified devices that are available. The good news is that the best devices are available. Uh, and by that, I mean the Polycom VVX business media range phones, the top bullet point there. Desk phones, uh, although we mentioned use of the soft client, and I mentioned earlier using a headset with a soft client and getting people away from desk phones, unfortunately, a desk phone is something that's become, become uh, embedded in tradition. And if you took a desk phone away from an end user now, they'd, they, they certainly wouldn't be happy if you told them, let's start using a headset instead. Uh, if we we're going to, I, I always say it, if we we're going to invent a telephone system now from the ground up, um, knowing what we know today and the technology that we have, we, we certainly wouldn't have a big bit of plastic connected to our computer with a, a dial pad on it and a huge plastic handset connected to a base unit, um, i.e. a traditional telephone. We would be using things like headsets and small mobile devices. But like I said, uh, tradition is a hard stick to break. So to that end, you'll find that when you deploy uh, Cloud PBX, uh, unless your users are really on side or you're, or you're determined to kind of change working practice, you'll find that you will roll out desk phones. Uh, there are two types of desk phones available. The Link Phone Edition devices, which are the bottom three in that bullet point, LPE devices, and then the ones I mentioned before, the Polycom VVX business media range phones. The LPE devices, um, Link Phone Edition devices, for anyone that doesn't know, Skype for Business was formerly called uh, Link. And when Link first came about way back in 2010, they released these desk phones. Uh, they're from three vendors, HP, Mitel, that was Astra back then, uh, and Polycom. And they had Link clients kind of built into the phone. So on the interface, it looked a bit like a Link client. And those phones have been around since since 2010. And then um, last year, Microsoft announced that they won't be developing the firmware for those phones anymore. They'll actually go end of life in 2018. So be aware that although those phones are available, um, uh, although those phones are available and for use on Office 365, they will go end of life in 2018. The preferred option is the Polycom VVX Business Media Range phone, which is probably the best-selling phone for Link and Skype for Business on-premises phones at this time. Uh, and those phones are also qualified for use in Skype for Business and Cloud PBX Online. Uh, what about CX300? Uh, yeah, so good, good question. Uh, that phone, uh, the CX300 USB phone. OK, so there, the CX300 R2 USB phone. Um, that is a device that you could use for Skype for Business and Cloud PBX Online. I should have mentioned, these phones that I've listed here, these are IP phones. So these phones, they will continue to operate um, in a telephony environment even when the PC that they're connected to is turned off. They're like a standalone phone, has its own IP address and IP connectivity uh, to Office 365. So the question that's been asked there about what about the CX300 R2 USB phone, um, as with any USB device, um, they, they don't go through a qualification process. 
they, they, they will work. It's nothing more than a glorified uh, speaker and microphone, much like a laptop speaker and microphone might be used. You could plug in a USB device and use whatever's on the end of it. In the case of the CX300, that's a glorified USB device. It just so happens to look like a desk phone. The downside to USB devices is when you turn the PC off that that USB device is connected to, naturally um, you use all call, uh, lose all calling functionality. Whereas the desk phones I've listed there, I should have mentioned at the beginning perhaps, um, they're always on phones if you like, much like a traditional desk phone would be. So in answer to your question, yes, you can use the Polycom CX300 USB phone. Uh, just be aware that it's not an always on phone. Uh, does that answer your question? Super. Um, trail of thought. Okay, yes. So be aware of the end of life that's available on the, or has been notified on the LPE devices. The VVX business media range phones, I think off the top of my head, there's like maybe five or six available in that, in that market range. Um, and they range from the 400 series, the 410, which is uh, like an information worker phone uh, with a, a nice colorful LCD display right up until the VVX 600, which is a larger, more colorful LCD display with touch, uh, touch screen capability and those types of things. The feature set on the business uh, media range phones is absolutely massive. Um, if you end up considering a cloud PBX solution and you get to the point where you're considering endpoint devices, it's always worth shortlisting a couple of devices um, of different types. So an information worker phone, an executive phone, and a common area phone, for, for example. Uh, getting down to a shortlist of devices that you think would be feasible in your organization and then having key stakeholders and relevant parties uh, pick, from, pick from that shortlist. Uh, with Cloud PBX, that's that's not so much uh, an issue because the amount of phones you've got is far less than if you're going for an on-premises solution. But like I mentioned, fortunately, the best phone that's available on-premises, the, the, the Polycom VVX, is also qualified for um, Skype for Business Online and Cloud PBX use. If you need to look at any of these phones, um, then because you're considering a Cloud PBX solution, then Nexus can normally uh, let you have a couple of these just for hands-on experience. Or you can come in and go in an immersion suite that we have and you can uh, get hands-on experience with the phones themselves. Uh, but I, I definitely suggest um, having a look at the phones and actually playing with them prior to any purchase rather than uh, rather than going by review or what someone says, etc. I'm waffling, so I'm going to move on to uh, example licensing costs. This slide is perhaps, um, I think, hopefully one of the best takeaways because it puts into perspective all the licensing that we've talked about that's required, puts some example uh, costs against licensing and just allows you to see what's required in various circumstances. Yeah, Dave Courts has also mentioned in IM there, Dave's one of the technical directors at, at Nexus. Um, Linkstore.co.uk is uh, affiliated with ourselves, um, but on there we ensure that there's always a, um, uh, a current portfolio of link qualified devices, etc. Uh, that are for on-premises deployments and cloud PBX. Um, I don't know if it's the cheapest store, but it's uh, it's definitely not. A, oh, I'm getting a thumbs up to say it is the cheapest store. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it's uh, if if nothing else, the portfolio is is always current and extensive. So if you need to know about devices that are qualified for use in particular scenarios, and you want to get a, uh, a kind of uh, a cost analysis of particular hardware, then by all means go to linkstore.co.uk. There's a direct link on there as well to a sales guide that can help you instantly. So uh, make, make a bookmark of that and uh, visit there if you need to. So the licensing costs, uh, like I said, hopefully this will put a few things into perspective. Um, I'll put some prices next to each of these licenses um, that I think is useful. Please note that these are from my own trial tenant that I've got, and I'm just a regular user. I don't have any kind of uh, education or charity framework status that might give me a discount for Office 365 licensing. So if you do fall into one of those categories, just please bear in mind that these prices here aren't going to be um, what you're paying under your own uh, 365 fr framework. This is what I see when I log into my portal as a normal end user. Um, so in, in, a, in a cost base scenario, if we were to take someone there, for example, on the right-hand side that doesn't have an existing Office 365 subscription, um, they have 25 users. Uh, all 25 of those users need the ability to make just local national calls. 
and it's been highlighted that two of those people will be setting up conferences. Everyone's going to be using the desktop client and everyone needs to have voicemail services enabled. What what would we be looking at minimum to to get that company up and running with a full cloud PBX solution? Uh, and this is this is per month, don't forget. And I'll mention now because you'll see this as we go through, but with Office 365 licensing and costing, you get more benefit and more value for money the more 365 services that you use. So the more you take advantage of with enterprise e-plans in 365, etc., whether it's SharePoint, Exchange, Skype for Business Online, Power BI, CRM, the more you take advantage of, the more bang for buck you get returning on your monthly subscription. So you can see that if someone doesn't have any kind of 365 subscription already, and they need to take out the minimum amount of license used to get to Cloud PBX with full calling functionality, you can see there are a relatively large number of licenses involved, and that's reflected in the cost as well. Uh, and that's why I put at the bottom there, you know, a consideration of a mail migration as well, because they need Exchange Online Plan 2 for voicemail services. Well, if you're using Exchange Online Plan 2 for voicemail, um, you know, perhaps you should consider moving your existing on-premises uh, Exchange and mail services up to the cloud as well, uh, thereby reducing or doing away with on-premises Exchange servers and associated costings and making the £633 a month uh, work for you rather than just be a, a giant additional cost that sits on top of stuff that you'd be duplicating essentially. Uh, so why do we need those licenses? Well the Skype for Business Online Plan 2 is the software that will run on the desktop, Skype for Business Client, that allows you to do your presence, your IM, your calling, etc. If you had Office 365 Pro Plus then it would be included in that. You need your Cloud PBX, we mentioned that right at the beginning, and we need our PSGN calling plan. Those are the two things that unlock our, our full phone system. The Exchange Online Plan 2, I've said, is required for voicemail and two PSTN conferencing licenses are because in the scenario where we said that just two users that would be setting up um, conferences uh, and sending those invites out with the DDI on them. Okay? That same scenario, but for an organization that already has an existing E3 subscription that they're using in 365, they're slightly reduced. Uh, yes, they still need the 25 Cloud PBX licenses, and yes, they still need the 25 PSTN calling plans. Once again, those those two licenses that unlock our phone system functionality. Uh, what are we missing from the previous slide? We don't need the Skype for Business desktop client license anymore, because with E3, you get the Office suite, and in that Office suite is the desktop client software. So we don't need that anymore. We don't need our Exchange licenses anymore, because voicemail services because that also is included in E3 so we're already paying for that um, and what else are we missing there let me just go back uh, exchange cloud PBX that's it just those two that have been knocked off of there okay so you can see we're we're missing out on two additional costs because there's already an E3 plan in there yes the E3 plan isn't listed there but I'm, I'm identifying additional licensing costs here on top of what you're already paying. And if you're using E3, then you're probably already already getting a, a good return on investment in terms of your features as well. So what we're saying there is, if you've got E3, for an extra £381 a month, um, your 25 users can have a full phone system in the cloud as well. £381 a month sounds like a lot, but I'll mention it at the end when we talk about the benefits briefly of moving to a cloud service. You're always running the latest technology. You don't have any hardware on site. You don't have to pay maintenance costs uh, or contracts for that hardware on site. You don't have to pay additional fees when it does go wrong and someone comes out to fix it. You don't have to pay fees to get it upgraded, etc. Um, those are the benefits of any cloud-based subscription, not just cloud PBX. Those are the reasons why so many people are moving their mail to the cloud now. Okay. And then finally, if we look at an E5 license, E5 was released, I think, earlier this year uh, in conjunction with the announcement of Cloud PBX, et cetera. Um, naturally, it's E5. It's the most feature-rich Office 365 subscription that you can uh, assign yourself to for a user. There's just a single additional license cost involved if you are an E5 user. Everything comes with E5, including the Cloud PBX licensing, with the exception of the PSTN calling plan itself. 
So for our 25 users here, the only additional license on top of an E5 would be the calling plans themselves, and that would be an additional £225 a month to essentially do away with your on-premises phone system and have it in the cloud instead. I've given everyone in these scenarios domestic calling plan based on the assumption that um, within this organization, perhaps, if you do need to call internationally, then you use your consumption billing to fulfill that cost. Uh, there'll be a degree of maths involved, whether it works out cheaper for you to assign a domestic and international calling plan to someone versus having a pot of consumption billing money that they can dip into. If you're only going to make five, six, seven international calls a month and they're going to be relatively short, then surely a consumption billing pot works out more cost effective um, for than an international dialing plan, especially when you might not know who's going to make that international call in the first instance. Okay, so the whole model is quite flexible. Um, but I hope I hope putting the prices up there at the beginning, and I'll just go back a couple of slides. I hope putting those prices up kind of uh, is useful. Um, if you need any further licensing um, advice, or in terms of cost especially, or you have a particular scenario, because I appreciate that you know, very rarely are two organizations going to be the same in terms of what they currently have and what they expect their individual usage to be, then by all means, uh, you, you can approach yourselves uh, and we can kind of break it down for you into a similar cost-based scenario example, if you like, uh, just to give you an idea of uh, what a typical cost it might be. I appreciate that um, at the end of the day, everything comes down to uh, the figure after the pound sign and things need to be uh, cost effective. One of the difficult things with any service-based or cloud-based subscription is often they will not come in cheaper than what you're currently running on-premises, but you need to be able to see past that and see the costs that you wouldn't be incurring in particular scenarios like the maintenance, et cetera, that I mentioned, uh, that I mentioned earlier. Okay, this, this is the last slide. Um, and there, there are a couple of key questions on here that will assist you in deciding whether or not something like Cloud PBX is suitable for yourselves. Do you have uh, or do you subscribe to additional 365 services? The reason that that question gets asked is because I mentioned it before. If you're already an E3, E4, or E5 user, and then much of the licensing that you will require to extend Skype for Business to be a Cloud PBX solution may already well be taken care of. So you, you'll be paying for licenses that could uh, be advantageous when you're looking to replace your phone system with Cloud PBX. Uh, if that's the case, then you need to identify those early on and say, look, we don't need this license anymore because we've actually already got that covered. Or perhaps, rather than take out that raft of licenses that were required in the first scenario, you know, perhaps you're saying, you, you know, we, we have been looking at cloud um, migration for mail services. Perhaps now is the time to do this. And you, you take out an E3 subscription, you have that take care of your, your exchange and your mail, and you also use that same subscription to take advantage of Cloud PBX offering now as well. Do you have existing contractual obligations with an existing, uh, existing PSTN carrier? And the third point as well, similarly, with an existing PBX vendor. If that's the case, more so with PS, PSTN carriers, they'll often tie you in for three to five years with your existing ISDN connection. If you're tied in for another three, four, five years, um, then you'd probably get penalized by breaking a contract to move to Cloud PBX with Microsoft's PSTN connectivity. So if you hark back to the, uh, the first couple of slides we looked at, I mentioned we wouldn't be looking at Cloud PBX with on-prem connectivity. Well, if you're tied in with an existing uh, ISDN contract, then perhaps Cloud PBX with on-prem connectivity is more of a preferred option for you. And we'll have an upcoming webinar going forward um, on Cloud PBX with on-premises PS10 connectivity that will just highlight some of the gotchas and requirements uh, for that. Uh, does your PBX offer you unique features that are critical to your organization? We mentioned the feature set already. Some PBX systems are heavily integrated with uh, CRM databases, for example. Perhaps you've had custom development on your phone system. When you move to a Cloud PBX solution, you get the feature set that everyone else gets with Cloud PBX that I touched on at the beginning with the bullet points. If your PBX offers you something that's not in that feature set, um, then you, you're kind of tied to your existing PBX for the time being. Uh, and in that same vein, does Microsoft PBX lack features that you would deem business critical? I mentioned the one that's kind of holding up people that are very interested 
interested in this solution at the moment, and that's the automatic call distribution and auto attendance services. Um, when, the, when that brick wall gets removed, I think we'll see uh, quite a lot of movement with Cloud PBX uh, quite rapidly as well. Much like, and I keep talking about it, that the Microsoft Exchange and mail migration. When that was first announced, there was all sorts of hoo-ha in the industry. People are going to stick with on-prem exchange, yada, yada, yada. But the, the, the reality is that for new startups and even small, medium business, having your mail services in the cloud and not having anything to worry about on-premises just makes sense. And that same process, I can see that's exactly where Cloud PBX is going to go as well. Are PS10 calling services available in your region? Yes, they are, if everyone here is from the UK. And do you have existing on-prem scope for business deployment you're seeking a further return on investment on? If you've deployed Link 2013, or Skype for Business recently, uh, you would have invested in um, perhaps additional hardware. You certainly would have invested in on-premises licensing and client access licenses. You might need a return on investment on that solution prior to just jumping ship and moving everything up to the cloud. And once again, at that point, you can start to look at Cloud PBX with a uh, on-premises breakout rather than using Microsoft PSTN completely in the cloud solution. Okay. Um, that's pretty much everything, guys. I, I, I know I talk fast. I apologize for that. Um, we'd be another half an hour if I didn't. I guess that's the silver lining. Um, but I wanted this to be a high-level overview. We haven't gone into things like network readiness assessment, You know, your connection to the Microsoft Cloud, how stable is it? Um, we haven't gone into things like that. We haven't gone into you know, user adoption and awareness and those types of things. Those are really deep dive. Um, and if you want to discuss those things, then you know you can definitely get in contact with uh, with Nexus uh, going forward, and, and you know we can we can arrange uh, be it just ad hoc consultancy, uh, advisory sessions. You come in and have a coffee, we'll chew the fat. If you're miles away, then we can just have a conference call. But this is really high level. I just want everyone to have a bit of food for thought. Like I said at the beginning, the hardest thing is awareness, and when Microsoft um, released something like this, it's it's just getting the knowledge out there and getting people to think about a solution. Otherwise, people will just stay on what they're happy with. And you'll get four years down the line, and you're paying above the odds for something that's really old, whereas everyone else has already moved forward. And the amount of on-premises deployments I do with Link and Skype for Business, you know, we unplug the old phone system, and I get, I get advised on what they're paying for a, a maintenance contract, you know, six, seven thousand pounds a year, and it's, uh, it's criminal. So it's important to stay current, and I hope that... Um, I hope that talking about Skype for Business and Cloud PBX with Microsoft PSTN connectivity has kind of just put something else on your on your placemat. So when it comes to replacing, you know, a Shortel or an Avaya system that's, you know, anything between five and fifteen years old, uh, this is something that you you don't write off and it's there uh, on your short list of considerations. Um, has anyone got any questions that they want to kind of throw into IM? Yeah, it's a good question, Simon. Should have mentioned that as well. Um, I kind of do everything ad hoc, so I don't, I don't have notes. But you can do partial DDI range ports. That's that's absolutely okay. Um, so that would once again be arranged between your existing carrier and Microsoft. You, you simply specify the uh, the block of numbers. What you'll probably find friction or resistance against is cherry picking numbers across a particular range. It'll have to be a block. So 1392667492 to 499, for example. Um, that's completely okay. So yes, you can you can port partial number ranges. That's okay. Uh, is there a feature to broadcast messages across desktop handsets? Uh, that's a good question, and uh, I don't know. I don't know any Link Phone Edition devices that we answered uh, that, that we talked about. The LP devices are going to end of life in 2018. Uh, when you say broadcast messages, are we talking about instant instant messages, like IM text messages? Okay, so like hunt groups, voice groups, where one one call is to many many devices. Uh, 
Uh, okay, no, there's there's not there's not Tannoy functionality, unfortunately. So you wouldn't be able to um, just pick up a handset, dial a number, start talking, and that would be broadcast instantly. Uh, that's not available, I'm afraid. Um, there are um, there are there is something called um, there's a device that's not qualified for Link Online or Skype for Business Online. That's not to say it wouldn't work, and that's called a PA1 from SNOM, and um, that's a USB device. I think it's USB, and you can plug it into a desktop client. And if you were to call that from another Skype for Business client, it will automatically answer and put itself on loudspeaker. That functionality is taken care of uh, by the device itself. And then you just start talking, and it's going to come out of this uh, this device, USB device. And when you hang up, that's that's going to close. Um, so you can kind of that that functionality is not available natively. I'll, I'll say that straight out. But if you have a requirement, quite often, due to the size and nature of the Skype for Business ecosystem and the, the massive amount of devices that are available, sometimes you can, get, you can get to a good compromise. Will it be qualified? Perhaps not. For the sake of 499, you buy an, a device to test it and say, hey, you know what, that works. Uh, you know, perhaps as long as it's not business critical and you're not spending tens of thousands on it, you know, that, that solution uh, might be OK. But no, there's no Tannoy functionality available, I'm afraid. Do you need to set up hybrid to move the users from on-premises to Office 365? OK, this is, uh, this is completely your prerogative, James. Hi, by the way. Didn't see, didn't see you in there. Um, it's, not, it's not a requirement. If you wanted to, you could um, create new users, brand new users, in Office 365 and enable them for Cloud PBX and give them PSTN calling plans. However, if you want those users to have things like single sign-on and password synchronization when they sign into their Skype for Business client, then uh, yes, something like uh, directory synchronization um, or, or um, hybrid, uh, sorry, directory synchronization or ADFS would be required. That would allow you to move your users up to 365 in the first instance and then enable them for Cloud PBX. You don't need hybrid between an on-premises link or Skype for Business environment. Um, which is what you might be referring to there. So no, you don't need hybrid between Skype for Business on-prem and 365. But yes, it would be advantageous to have some kind of directory synchronization that moves your user accounts up there, and then you enable them for Cloud PBX. Um, that type of functionality, if you want to talk a bit more about that, we can, we can do that on the phone. Uh, does that, I, know, I know you're quite first already in link. Does that answer your question? Yeah, OK, cool. If you want to talk more about that, that that's completely fine. Um, but no, hybrid isn't a requirement. Any other questions, guys? OK, cool. If anyone's around tomorrow, I think some of you got it penciled in or not, um, at 9.30, um, and it'll be a lot quicker than this one. I've gone for an hour already. Um, I'll be showing people the, um, the 365 interface and just what it looks like when you've got a user enabled for Cloud PBX and PSTN call-in, and how you request numbers, how you can request a number port, um, how quick it is to, to do those things, where you assign consumption billing, how you put money in the pot, etc. just to show you how friendly and readily available those services are uh, with just a few clicks, and to show you where you'd be managing Cloud PBX from if you were to take out that subscription. Um, thanks very much for your time, guys. I it was uh, i hope it was useful